Uh, coming up, the Carter Effect. Sean Menard has done an unbelievable doc that is going to be played at the Toronto International Film Festival. When we come back, we're going to talk to the director. Here's just a little look. We're here with the newest member of the Toronto Raptors, Vince Carter, drafted number five overall. Vince, tell me how excited you are about playing in Toronto. You know how popular that thing is going to be, the Carter effect, and I think of any study of something that you wanted to do in terms of subject matter in Toronto, specifically at this particular time in history, I think, where um, the the feelings about this particular athlete, I think, have drastically changed over the last four or five years. Sean Menard joining us here on Raw Mike Richards. Thanks so much for coming in, Sean. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, you know what? I got, I got to be honest. Um, the, the name Vince Carter, as you very well know, because you, you, you not only have you done, the, obviously, this extensive uh, uh, film, but when you lived it, when you saw it, I have a son who we watched that final shot when it falls short against Philadelphia. We had to go through uh, the anger of how dare you uh, receive a diploma on the biggest... Di- th- there's so much, and then the interview where he says, I'm not dunking anymore, and then he explains that, well, I, I wasn't trying or you know all this kind of stuff where he became i think at some point sean what do we say the the most despised athlete maybe in toronto depending on who you talk to and of a certain age group too because there are some who don't from, the, from the, being from being the king of well, the, the younger kind of generation like, definitely i don't think yeah. we felt that yeah. no the you did all. not no, no but uh, yeah. at, at, at 54 i'm going you <laughs> it, it i'll tell you what about it felt like betrayal there was a hurt about it. And so in terms of you venturing to do a film like this, there's so much ground to cover. Mm. How did this come into your head? What what gives you this idea that you're going to make a film like this? Uh, well, this was a project I, I tried for a couple of years pitching around to, to networks up here actually in Canada, and I didn't have any luck. You're uh, kidding. Which is surprising. Yeah. Oh, and, my God. My mentality has always been find American subjects, you know, to, 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 you know, to find to that, um, you know, that network and, and that fan base down, down south. So this project I thought was dead, dead in the water. And then I had finished my first feature film called Fight Mom. It followed a, a female MMA fighter who's also a mom. She makes it to the UFC. And, it, and LeBron James just starts his production company. And that's the first project that they, they picked up. We partnered. Um, that's unbelievable, Sean. Sean, now where'd you grow up? Where are you from? I'm from Hamilton. He's a Hamilton You're guy. You're from the Hammer. What um, high school did you go to? Uh, I went to Sir Alan McNabb. See, I would have guessed uh, Catholic boy. I would have oh, thought, no. No, no. no man. No, no you, man. you hated them. That's what I, you hated. Yeah, so, there was a rivalry. Yeah, so, yeah. so there you go. You, uh, you're, now, for those that, that, that might remember, you were on the, on the score. Mm, yeah, yeah, way back, way back. Yeah. Way back. I was in a, a yeah, reality show. Uh. <laughs> okay. You go from that, and then you get what? A phone call from LeBron James people that say, we'd like to partner with you? I, the way you say it sounds like there was no struggle, and it was just the, <laughs> no. the following week. You know, I, there were about five years. Six, I'm seven sifting years through that. <laughs> I mean, you, you could have been a waiter. Maybe you're down <laughs> underneath the gardener washing windows. Yeah, I don't no, know what happened to that, that period. Yeah. But, but you get to a point where... That's just, uh, there's a lot of people who have spent their whole lives uh, doing this kind of work, and they're never getting, a call. They're never getting mm. that call. Right. So, I mean, I was making, I had left the score. I was working there as a producer for a couple of years. Um, shout out to Irene. Yeah, James absolutely. Wife. She yeah. said hi, by the oh, way. Oh, she nice. says, make sure you say hi to Sean. <laughs> that I, you guys Do it on air. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, <laughs> I, you know, I had left there, and I had, uh, I had joined up with TSN for a little while, and I was doing promos for a few weeks, and I just thought, I'm, I'm a storyteller. I, I can't. I can't do the things that I want to do here. So I left and took a chance, and I, and I just decided to, I'm going to make sports documentaries, and after they're done, I'm going to try and find a home for them. So I started selling them back to Sportsnet, TSN. Um, I did about five of them. And then after a while, I wanted to stretch my legs. I was like, okay, those are half-hour docs. I want to make feature length. Um, and then I started making Fight Mom. But, but to, to your point, um, for a director... It's not like people are just cutting checks saying, oh, you know, what do you, you've never made a film before, but here you go. (laughs) So I had to finance that whole thing, Fight Mom myself. And I went into, I mean, 
I left my apartment. I was like, I, I got to save money on rent, uh, couch surfing, uh, money in, money out. And then after I got to a point where it was almost done, um, LeBron's uh, team decided to come in. You know, it's, um, and Dave can speak to this as well, you know, when starting a, a project like this, uh, a very good friend of mine, John Belbick, shout out to uh, Johnny. He said, okay, so you want to do this thing. You know, it's, 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 it's not necessarily against the grain. He goes, but I know what your personality is. I know why you're doing this and it's the right thing to do. But he looks at me and he says, so how much pain can you take? I said, I beg your pardon? Pain. How much pain can you take? And pain means money. <laughs> how long can you go with no money coming in? What are you prepared to give up? And I think when you talk about what you just said, that's pain. And so how, how many years do you I was, think? I was willing to die for it. I yeah. mean, I was willing to endure whatever it took to, to get to the point where um, I, c I could reach. Or, I, you know, there's these stories inside me that I wanted to get out and this heart that I wanted to tell. And, yeah, that's the, that was the pain I was willing to take to, to get to that point, right? Yeah, it's it's amazing, and, and there's there's a bigger side of it, and I hope one day maybe you do a documentary on yourself on how how you got to the point where you are. And I know there's still a lot of stuff to talk about in the future, but let's talk about the Carter effect here. As far as the premise of the story, uh, fans out there, what should they expect from it? Is this Vince Carter as a Toronto Raptor from day one to? end of day or is it Vince Carter till this day with the Memphis Grizzlies uh, we don't cover too much of the of his recent later half yeah. definitely it's the early years okay it's, it's um, you know it, it starts the film opens uh, where Toronto was as a franchise from from literally day one press conference announcing the, the team name as the Toronto Raptors and um, and then the trajectory of uh, you know Tracy McGrady coming in and, and Vince Carter where he came from and all, all that happened on the draft I mean there was a lot of um, drama even on, on drafting Vince. Sure I think that was, was one, yeah. one thing that I even sat down, I, I, whether I forgot or I mean, I definitely wasn't paying attention back there. And I thought, oh yeah, the Raptors didn't even draft no. this guy. No, it was a trade with the Golden State Warriors, right? Mm -hmm, for yeah. his roommate, That's and, right. you know, Jameson. So, um, so yeah, and then we cover obviously the glory years and the rise and the fall. So in talking with him, because most people are never going to get this close to a guy who is one of the biggest names of our generation. And in, in, in Canada, unless you're going to talk about Steve Nash, with, which is a separate issue. Um, he doesn't even have an agent anymore. He's not an easy guy to, to get a hold of. Oh, yeah. So really? he's doing it himself? Uh, yeah, he's got, he's, got a, he's got a team, but I mean, he, I had to go through the Memphis PR, but that was the interesting thing. I just, I just, we just took a jump, and we were filming this thing well into it. Vince was one of the last, literally the last interview I got. I was going to say, how, do, how does Vince sign off on this? Because this is Vince, this is about Vince Carter. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy because um, if you don't have Vince, you obviously don't really have a film. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, and, and we knew that the, we, we wanted this thing to premiere at TIFF. We were hoping, you know, that it was it was um, going to get to that point, and I was. Now, confident. do they have to invite you? Is there like a, some sort of approval process? Like, how does that work for Tiff? You just submit, you and submit. then you you hope that it's a good enough story and a good enough film. I was confident in the project. I, I in my opinion, I think it's the greatest NBA doc ever made. Cool. I think it's up there in, the, in one of the better sports docs ever made. And I mean, no one dies. There's no. There's not the huge drama. <laughs> but for an American to come here and do what he did in the way that he did it, I always say if if Vince Carter was a three point shooter or you know, a, a fundamental guy in the post, we wouldn't even yeah. be talking about the Carter effect. Yeah. Let's be honest. So, coming out of this, what do you think of Vince Carter? What do you think of him? Because uh, you got closer than almost, well, certainly anyone in this room and probably most of the people watching and listening across the country today. I love the dude, man. Yeah. He, I mean, for him to, I, that was the thing. We were told we were going to have 20 minutes. And when I sit down with Vince, it was, you know, Grizzlies PR giving the rap side and Vince saying, sit down, we're going to keep going. Yeah. And, you know, and, and he just, the way he lit up uh, going back there, you could tell, you, you talk about the hurt that the, that the fan base has. There's, there's probably that same equal hurt on Vince's end for how he, you know, he views things a lot more. He also has another side of it that the fans don't get to hear. Right. Um, you know, the business end. And I think it's interesting because some athletes can lay that out. He, Vince kind of chose to just go about his business. Um, but I also think he takes pride in being the oldest NBA player right now, 40 years old, because a lot of people would say, you know, he's soft or he's injury prone. And now, you know, that he's standing the test of time. And See, people say that, but the guys he played with would argue differently. That's the interesting yeah. thing. Well, if, if he's the type of player that really quit on his team, wouldn't the fa the, his current teammates been been really upset? When I go back and talk to them, there was none of that. There was a whole other 
they would always say, you don't know the other side of things. Right. And, they, and you could tell, I mean, even speaking with Jalen Rose, he would say, you know, when, when, a, when a franchise wants to rediscover themselves or uh, have their own sense of identity, and they know it's not a popular move getting rid of a franchise player, what do they do? And typically, you know, Jalen says it in the film, is, is they start feeding things to the media that may or may not be true or start to kind of bring this guy down so that when he does eventually leave... Um, you know, they don't kind of turn on. It's a business. I, I, you know, I get it. But that was the interesting thing. I didn't expect to go down that rabbit hole and kind of discover that. A lot of names behind it here. Uh, Vince Carter, of course, Drake, David Stern, Tracy McGrady, Michelle Carter, Scott, Steve Nash. Uh, when you're sitting down with these people talking about J- Jalen Rose, as you brought up, when you're sitting down talking to the different people, are, are you, are you, you know, you kind of touched on it with your last answer, but you, you, you got an idea in your head. And you got the puzzle, and all of a sudden this puzzle's getting bigger and bigger. Are you feeling this while you're talking to these different people? And you're like, man, this is this monster is now became like the Andre the Giant of monsters, so to speak. And that's you know that's an important part too. You have a rough idea of what the film's going to be, but you don't fully know because right. I I don't use voiceover, I don't use my voice, so the entire narrative I have to get out of you when I'm interviewing you or whoever the athlete is. So. I might think, oh, this part, this section might be uh, very interesting. But if I'm not getting those sound bites, now I have to go into a different path. So, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned the puzzle piece. That's exactly, you know, especially when you, you get all those interviews. And we interviewed, uh, I mean, about 35, 36 sure. different people, which yeah. is a massive amount. And you get down and you figure out, okay, every piece can fit in this particular puzzle. Well, what's the best one? What's the story that we're trying to tell? And, um, I mean, that, therein lies the challenge, right? Right. We're in conversation with Sean Menard here on rawmicrichards.com, watching on the website, of course, the dedicated YouTube channel. The Carter Effect is the movie, the Toronto International Film Festival, Sean Menard, the, uh, what are you, what are you, the everything. So in film, what, the director, yeah, the yeah, producer, director, producer editor, the, the, yeah. the writer, the, <laughs> the commandant of the movie. <laughs> Uh, and and some of the names that you mentioned too. I mean, we talk about Steve Nash, and so there's there's another guy that I, I I've always wanted to talk to and never did. Um, there's there's another guy whose story is is so unlike uh, almost any other. I mean, you got that this British background and a guy who's out in Victoria and loves soccer, and then he goes to uh, what was it Santa Clara? He goes to Santa Clara. He's a you know, he's a not only a white boy, like a really white white boy. He's a Back-to-back MVP, you know, uh, star of the NBA, whether you want to argue about whether it should be back-to-back, and that's another conversation. So you're sitting in front of him now. I mean, in terms of coolness of a project, like, what's your next one? What are you, talking to the Pope and uh, you know, all of a sudden, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, what are you doing here? This is crazy. High five. Like, like, this is really something. You've really hit on a project. And what was it like with Steve Nash talking I mean, to him? Nash was great. Nash, we definitely, I mean, obviously he talked about Vince, but, for Steve, I wanted to get his part on the, the, the effect, the after part. And like you said, you know, for, for uh, a Canadian player in his time to get that scholarship down to Santa, Santa Clara, was mm-hmm. it? Santa Clara, yeah. I mean, that's not a big time, you know, perennial no, it's not. college powerhouse no. by any means. So for him to see, and that was, that, that to be honest, that's where this project even kind of came to life for me, is that I'm a big college hoops fan, and I would start watching all these big time players, and all of a sudden I would see their hometowns, or I would watch the, um, the recruiting web pages. And I would see with their hometowns and say, oh, Toronto, Mississauga, oh, that's interesting. And then you check their the year they were born. And then you kind of start backtracking a bit and you go, okay. Yes. Well, how old were they yeah. when Vince was doing his thing? And that's the impressionable age, right? Six to eight, nine. Absolutely. When you're watching that thing. And, and that was that was a big thing to get out of Steve was, was the impact that, because I think Steve will say, like, these players, they don't quote me as the one, you know, these... <laughs> well, Jamal McGlore is very open about that influence of Vince Carter. Very open about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, too, the other the other thing that, uh, that you bring to light is, there was a time where, you know, when you're looking at the hometowns and you're trying to see, like, so when Leo Routens goes to Syracuse, I'm losing my mind. A guy from Toronto. He actually, he's, he's going to play for Jim Beheim and I'm going to see him on TV and, well, maybe see him on TV, probably come... Like, there was a time for Canadians that if the guy just got some, some scrub time in the last couple of minutes, go, yeah, that guy's from Mississauga, can you believe it? Now we get guys who, who are getting drafted number one. Mm, one and you know, done, all, yeah. all, all, all these these tremendous things. Basketball has come a long way. To think that Vince did not have influence on uh, Tristan Thompson or, you know, uh, Corey Joseph. I mean, you can go down the line. Andrew, Andrew Wiggins, Wiggins. You know, yeah. you, 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 you start to realize, and I think this is where the softening has happened. 
Like, if he truly was that bad a dude, even though he won, I don't think you'd see what you've seen. Because I think that's what's taken some of the anger out of it. What do you think? I, well, you're exactly right. And, then, and that's a big part of the film is, is the, the impact that he had on the country and the culture and, and changing people's lives, you, you know, young Canadian players, that it took a player just to be able to see that Toronto across, across the chest yeah. on, the, on that big stage. You see it in music with Drake. You're seeing all these other young artists now uh, look up to a guy like Drake because it, he's from here. I mean, that, first of all, Drake and what he's been able to do in the music industry is crazy. To have somebody in that world of hip-hop be... Oh, he's Hall of Fame in his own category. We never had someone like that from here. Right. No. You know? Yeah, and Drake's part of this project. Speaking of Drake, one of the executive producers, he's also on the film itself. How did, how did I guess, from, from the influence of Drake, I, you just kind of touched on it. He wasn't an NBA prospect or anything, but definitely one of, you know, influenced by Vince Carter in that era. How did he fit into this project, and how did you get him on board? Uh, well, I mean, it's funny how these, you know, superstars, whether in music or a- athletics, you know, they all kind of hang out and sure. talk, right? So LeBron and, and Drake have a nice relationship going, and I, to, to my best knowledge, they just kind of approached him just to be in the film. And Drake and his team all of a sudden said, whoa, this is, this is a project that's near and dear to us. Sure. You know, Drake will even say that in his music... Um, in his career, Vince was a huge impact for him. Um, so they wanted to be involved right from early on, just making sure that they were, because let's face it, you know, American production company, uh, Drake doesn't know me from a hole in the wall. So it's they wanted to make sure it was done right. It was done to a level where if they were going to attach themselves, they wanted to be proud of it. And, um, I mean, September 9th, it's uh, premiering over at uh, Prince of Wales, which is which is not a small, that's the largest venue at the entire Toronto yeah. Film Festival. It's a great venue, too. That's and, a beautiful, And they're beautiful all coming building. out for red carpet event. I mean, it's going to be a star-studded lineup. And so that that's kind of how, you know, Drake got involved. And, and shout out to those guys, because in talking to them, you see people make it from, you know, from their hometowns, and then they go off, and they, they might be building their mansions in L.A., and, and they don't, you know, come back as much. But... For those guys, they take so much pride into shining the biggest spotlight on this city. Sure. They are so passionate about it, um, and they just want it to grow and, and, and you know be recognized as the best in in music, you know, fashion, uh, sports, culture, everything. So um, that's how they got kind of involved, and it's kind of grown from yeah. there. You talk about September 9th. Before you were on, Mike and I were kind of talking about <clears throat> its project in this project going into TIFF. When you look at the star power behind it. This might be the biggest event at TIFF, in my opinion. And I would be shocked. And you can throw Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise in a, in a star-studded whatever. This this documentary, this film, will be bigger than this. That's that's enormous. It's, it's so it's funny as a you know as an independent filmmaker having to, to go on the grind and get people out to your your films or, yeah. or hoping that people. I don't even have to do any promotion. No. This, is just, this film <laughs> yeah. sells itself. Absolutely. <laughs> Look at the trailer. It doesn't even have any dialogue. No. So I just shot, you know, show faces. Actually, it is a little lazy. I, I got to admit, I, I wrote that down. <laughs> lazy Sean Menard. How's about a couple of words every once in a while? But the impact of the faces that you see on there, and, and, and this actually plays into what Toronto has really been embraced for around the world, is its diversity. Is di- the diversity. And to think at some point that I would connect a National Basketball Association team with a Sikh who sits underneath the basket and literally throws, well, I'm going to call it a turban. Uh, uh, is it a turban? Don't, don't, don't get mad. But that's what he did until they said you can't do that anymore. And yet he's embraced as literally being part of the Raptors. And you talk to him. Yeah, the super fan. Yeah, I mean, that's he, he's a byproduct and a kind of reflection of when you go to a Raptors game, it's different. It looks different in the stands than any other uh, NBA arena. And it does. And that's a reflection of our beautiful city. I mean, that's, what, in my opinion, what makes a city the best in the world, right? Yeah. You have all, all different cultures coming together. And, um, yeah, it's interesting that he's kind of become the face. And even on the NBA, he's he's like the chairman of diversity. <laughs> they've, they've brought him yeah. along. And <laughs> because generally, you know, th- there'd be a time in the city where that would have been hated. That just the, 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 the understanding that he did not have a white face and was doing that. There'd be a time probably, I'm saying, even in the 70s, where that all of a sudden would be frowned upon. But as you mentioned, the, the demographic of, of what the Raptors bring. And I would argue to a degree, uh, TFC 
is is a real reflection of that too. I mean, it's just all over the map in terms of uh, who goes to those games. It's what makes Toronto special. And I think since the All Star game, the NBA All Star Day, I also think that that just boosted it and highlighted it even more. And I think players from around the world, because that's what the NBA is, look at this city and go, "Well, this wouldn't be bad to play in." Like I really think it has become an uh, an attractive city to play this particular sport in. And if you're drawing the all the way back and putting a pin at the start, as much as I think some people would say, well, Damon Stoudemire of the time was was a, and of the time it was, but it's you can't put that even in the same universe as Vince Carter. No, I mean Damon didn't open up a nightclub here, you know what I mean? And he, and that's what Vince Vince partnered in the nightclub, and he wanted his his, his idea was there there needs to be something for these players to go and do after the games when they're here on the road. Sh- show how great this city is yeah. um, because a lot of the players and you guys saw it right a lot of you know and hear about Americans when they get drafted they wouldn't want to come here or as soon as their the rookie contract's up they're out and wives didn't want to come here of the players saying, I'm not going up there that was one of the interesting things talking to the players is that you would keep hearing some of the former guys and talk about their time in Toronto they would say it was really safe and I kept hearing that across the line safe why, why am I keep hearing this and then I started you know, kind of dissecting it and understanding that some of these some of these uh, players that would play in certain American cities mm-hmm. um, wouldn't feel that comfortable with their wives and kids going out. Uh, you know, in a certain area in in you know downtown Memphis, even is no picnic. No, in um, fact, it could be really no, scuzzy. No, at it times. isn't. I've been yeah, there. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you bang there on. are some places in in America that you just uh, you know, especially in and around the arenas, at they night. can look third world. I, you go around New Orleans and take a look, and it's even worse after Katrina. Uh, and, and so you've got to understand that in Houston, what's going to happen down there as well is going to be very difficult. And it also brings out desperation in people because that's really what we're talking about. But it's interesting that you say that because they're also, I don't know if you, if, I mean, because we certainly don't want to give away anything that's in, in the film because you want to go see it. There's always talk about Vince's mom, too. So so these are things that we honestly, and, and you know, I'm in the business at that point. So, uh, you know, so 2001 is, is the team, the Team 1050. It's the team at this point. You hear all the all this innuendo and stuff about his mom starts coming up. I'm like, where does that start? Because quite honestly, to regurgitate it on the air, I'm full of shit. Because I I really don't even know if the story's true or not. And guys would go on and talk about that. Yeah, I mean, and and, and I and I and I went down that road with Vince's mom. She gave a great interview. My God, she it was 90 minutes wow. with her, one of the longer ones, and it was just. Um, I noticed from t- from doing other projects when you ask somebody a question. And they go on at a certain length. And next thing you know, this interview's half hour. You've only asked two or three questions. <laughs> There's a reason for it. That person has something inside that they've been wanting to get out. They just haven't been asked. Sure. And she was that case. And she, uh, we got a nice trust going where she ended up saying things that uh, she had never said on camera before which was great. But then as my job was, there was, a, there's a, there's a thin line. Is this a Vince Carter documentary? And that's going to, you know, cater towards the diehard sports fans that lived and breathed it. Or is there something more here that's that the, av- I mean, I always say any project I do, whether it's a hockey player or a baseball player. Yeah. I'm going to get that fan base right out of the gate. But to me, the challenge and the skill part is I want to get that bigger market. The people that don't care, about. It should stand on its own, that film, rather you're an X's and O's kind of guy. It's, it's, an, yeah. it's an injustice to call it just a sports film. In fact, that bothers me when people sure. kind of label me, even as a, you make sports films. There's almost this, um, you, you see it definitely in the film festival circuits. They, they got their you know, certain way they like to... <laughs> <laughs> Guys in the pipes going, yes, you're the one who covers the people who bounce balls and so on. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So um, that's why I even take a pride out of this, and we see it uh, being highlighted so much, and, and you have the festival... Uh, you know, talking it up so t- to such a degree is 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 yeah, it's not just a, a basketball film. So my job was kind of yeah, figuring out how far do we go in with with because uh, there was issues over um, her, her having her own parking space. You remember? Yes, the, the yes, that's right. that was one of the stories. Yeah. That and was it, one of the stories. And that, and that, it didn't make it in the film, but her response was interesting. Is that before that she would park across the street or two blocks away? Then all of a sudden the uh, tele- uh, televised games would start showing her her reactions in the crowd. Now all of a sudden she's walking the two blocks, and now all of a sudden people are recognizing her, coming up to her, and it starts to get to a point where it, in the beginning it's fun, but then all of a sudden maybe Vince isn't playing so well. Right. And yeah. and mm-hmm. you have some people you know drinking a little bit before the game. Sure. And, yeah, Russell and does that all the time. By the way, he's heavy drinking. Shout out to Russell. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> 
So you got guys like Russell uh, maybe accosting her before the game. <laughs> yeah. It happens. Yeah, that's right? true. And now all of a sudden she's mentioning this to Vince and and that, or mentioned to the PR and they say, we, well, you know what? We're, what we're going to do, we're going to give you this spot. Uh, your own, she was the only family member to receive this parking spot. Now all of a sudden. This story is 180 completely different than anyone who had perspective on it. Bingo. So, I mean, you start getting these little things. You start getting the other side of things. Um, and all that, although that's, that's interesting, you, you, start, you start getting to the point where you start, uh, what do they say, they, uh, there's like a, t- a term for it, you're, you're killing your babies or, you know, having to figure out which little storylines or which little scenes are leaving the film. Right. Sure. It so. becomes tough for you. The editing process, all of a sudden, because, let's face it, in your world, depending on how you edit this thing, you can have eight different kinds of movies 100%. if you wanted. Hundred percent, and that's that's the job of any good storyteller. Is you want to make sure that you're you're going on this line, and any little storyline that storyline or feature comes up, you have to ask yourself: is this is this stalling us where we need to go, derailing us, or is this keeping us on our path? And that was one of those particular things that you know you fit it in. You go, yeah, that's that's great for the for the diehards um, or the people that that know about it, but someone that's watching this in random USA, maybe not so much. Right. We're sitting here in 2017, uh, and to this day, anytime you're watching anything with the NBA, and it's and it's hard to believe that it's been 17 years, but the Vince Carter, it's overreaction, still gets played in and out of every city because it's the coolest highlight. The dunk was fantastic, but the reaction of it's over, yeah. it's over. Yeah. What does what? impact did that have on Vince considering that sometimes we look at the NBA dunk competition today as in uh, who's, jump the shark that's what they call it I mean literally signed up for it now because yeah. they they don't have the Vince Carters and the Michael Jordans and the um you know the you know the the bigger names the you know uh, Wilkins guys like that of the past what did that mean to him at that time well, right from the start I, I said from the jump um NBA footage obviously costs money. Sure. For each second that appears in the film, so there we were. Wow. We we had we had some nice leeway. I, I feel LeBron uh, <laughs> has a little bit of pull. A little in that. bit. Yeah. So yeah. that was great. But I said I want to make sure that I want people to feel when it gets to that slam dunk contest section. That to me is one is probably the most important aspect of this entire effect, so to speak, or his career. And the fact that he was wearing Toronto across his chest. Yes. And I think my, my biggest thing is I need to make sure, I want people to feel how they felt when they first watched it. In that I don't, I don't want a dunk to go. And then in the film, we cut back and Vince starts talking about, oh, yeah, you know, Tracy held the ball up. And I, want, I don't want to ruin the momentum or have other people's reactions. I got those just in case. But when I sat down, I felt very strongly that this needs to speak for itself. This needs to play raw. I want people to feel it in a way that they maybe haven't felt since they first watched it. Uh, we added some some beautiful music. Had a great composer, Thomas Caffey, out of out of um, Los Angeles. We brought in some strings to lay down, and we really felt that the the reactions and the video spoke for itself. And also, hearing the announcer's voice is is what they're watching. I mean, they didn't even know how to call it, and, right. and their reactions have become iconic. Yes. Even saying that it's over, yeah. it's yeah. over. Like who hasn't done that to this day? Even if you're out, you know, playing regular ball with buddies, or or you make a golf putt, or you, anything. You know what I mean? You could. You. It's such a universal. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, so and yeah. I, I would I would go on YouTube and I would type in a Vince Carter doc, uh, interview and I would see that he would he would talk about each dunk sure. many times over, and I and I wanted to I felt like I wanted to try and get reactions out of him that weren't just stock answers that he'd had for the last you know 20 years so when i when we sat down i said listen the dunk competition is going to speak for itself i'm not we're not going to go into each dunk but i want to know every step leading up to it that that day because there's a there's a whole other side of things that people don't necessarily know that went in before the slam dunk competition and i just see his his face light up he i think he really liked that because um uh, i mean I, one thing i didn't realize is how this dunk contest, it wasn't just something that, he, you know, he just said one day, oh, I'm just going to enter this. This is something that he's been studied, leading up for his whole his whole career, uh, even though he was still young at that point. But this was this was a this was a dream when he made it to the NBA to, to take part in this. So um, I'm very excited. I spent the most 
probably editing time and, and awesome. analyzing on the on the slam dunk competition part. And if you don't have goosebumps going through your entire body, you, yeah. you check for a pulse because that's a special part of the film. The film is called The Carter Effect. The director, producer, Sean Menard here on rawmikerichards.com. It just, uh, I mean, I can't wait to see it. I mean, I really can't wait to see it. And you also brought up, you know, we talk about some of the issues. You talk about his, you know, um, his mom uh, and some of those issues. You've talked about those who, uh, I guess, uh, you know, watched him those he played with, I don't know if there was a bigger name in terms of that story than Tracy McGrady. We just heard about, you know, how the, the, the surroundings that his mom had about some of those stories that were that turned out completely different. Were you taken by what Tracy McGrady had to offer in the film? Of course. First of all, just interviewing Tracy um, was, was a very bizarre experience <laughs> because <laughs> normally you... The athlete or the particular star maybe is not on time. You're set it up and you're waiting for uh, quite a while. This particular day, we had filmed with him behind the scenes at ESPN. He was shooting a show called The Jump. And we're in Los Angeles. And we go across the streets of the hotel. And we start setting up. And then all of a sudden, Tracy walks in. And he just sits down. And I was talking up his, uh, his bodyguard. Um, and we were kind of hitting it off, talking college football um, off camera. And then all of a sudden, Tracy's like, hey, I can we just do this now? And I look around, the crew is just shocked because now one of the biggest stars in yeah, that we're looking yeah. to interview has just walked in and asked, can <laughs> and we that, do this now? That never happens. Never <laughs> happens. And we are not set up at all. No, I no. just see the color go out of my <laughs> cinematographer's <laughs> face. <laughs> so well, I go, well, it's going to be about, uh, I don't know, half hour. And that's, you know, usually oh, an hour yeah. is, a, is maybe like a pretty good. So he's, all right, I'll wait and just sits down. <gasps> he's just sitting there now. So now he's just sitting in the room. The crew is just trying to set up as fast as they can. And um, so I was able to, this, which was great about it is now I'm able to uh, get a bit of a trust system going yes, now with Tracy. Yes. And I'm able to talk him up. Just like you did with the bodyguard kind of thing, the rapport, right? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. then I think once people feel like you're, you're, um, you're doing something that's well researched. You're not, um, you know, you've done your work, or you know that this is something maybe a little bit different than what they're used to. Then all of a sudden they feel, uh, especially when they find out who else is in the film. That was the biggest thing. We right. had some players that would say, "No, not interested," because I kind of understand these guys are retired or they're busy. Um, no one's paying them money to be on camera. You want to come in and talk about this thing about Vince Carter, but then as soon as they would hear who else was in it, it was almost. Uh, as though they would say, "Oh, I want to. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll take part." Yeah. Um. So Tracy was great. So by the time we got on camera, um, we were we were we had a real had a real good rapport. Yeah, you're and, in fifth gear basically. That's awesome. What a great story. See, because you you're, you're praying for that, Dave, because because you know when you have to interview an athlete, oh. when you're hoping for something. Some people uh, to you, take to take what yeah. Sean just said. It, 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 I've been around some athletes on the sit down interview. Obviously, not to the level of what you're doing, but when you sit down with an athlete, you have everything set up on double cameras. If you say five minutes to an athlete, they get pissy. Yeah. They sit there <clears> and they think they think you just told them. How about five hours? Yeah. It's like no, no, just give me five minutes. And you're, I could, I could, I could feel exactly what you're going through in that situation. J.R. Reed. Ate a ham sandwich in front of me one time. We were live from Gretzky's. It was me and Derringer. And uh, so we're sitting there, and as John is talking. <laughs> so what did I, 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 I It was in the day. I started doing peewee going, oh, <laughs> guess you're hungry. <laughs> Eating a ham sandwich. Like, what are you, what are you supposed to say, they right? They could care less, right, a lot of them, right? They don't well, understand, you know, to your point, that the, the crew is here and how, how big of a deal oh, it yeah. means to you Absolutely. and how much you really need. If I don't get good sound bites out of Tracy McGrady, I'm already thinking, and that's why this project, I've never felt the pressure because I, my, my, my boys, my crew, my, my friends would, if they're like constantly, like, you better not, can we, I don't know, I don't know if we can swear on this, but it was like, of course you can draw Mike Richards, you can do what you want. <laughs> uh, you better not fuck this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight up, all yeah. the time. That's, so. not, that's a great support system. <laughs> don't fuck it up. Okay, and action. I think we all have friends yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So, you awesome. know, if I'm off doing a story about, uh, you know, something else, that's one thing. But now I'm in my, my home hometown now, right? I've, been, I've lived in Toronto for a decade. So yeah. um, getting Tracy was, was pivotal, right? Um, especially for those early years um, and being able to get his – his take on every it's so interesting to see it too he was just a kid when he came up here every sure bit was. of 18 I, yep. and you know what i think people kind of uh, and and this is why it's great that you 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 talk about it in a way in which it really is it's storytelling you're telling someone's history and um you know when when these privileged 
to a degree, privileged athlete, you think that there's going to be an error about it. They think there's going to be an arrogance just because we've seen it on television for maybe the last three, four years, whether they come from North Carolina or whether they come from UCLA at the time, whatever school it happens to be. And then you meet them. Uh, I remember looking uh, years ago at, uh, at Rocket Ishmael. And so I see that crazy bowl game, and he returns it for what? It was two, two kick returns he had in that game for Notre Dame. I don't, maybe it was three. I don't remember. And I'm thinking, oh, this guy. And then I hear the money. So there's McNall and Gretzky and Candy. I'm thinking, this guy's going to be probably unbearable. He comes into the this fan. This is early Argos. This is, com- yes. Yeah. This, this, so, so, so it's this 1990, I guess. Comes in, yeah. And he comes in, uh, you know, sort of towards the, the fan, and uh, he's with his mom. And his mom said the same thing that you just mentioned. I'm glad he's coming here because it's safe. That was number one. Number two, it was a, a racial, uh, you know, um, comment in that, not, not, not that she was racist. She was saying that she wanted to come to a place where diversity was embraced, that there wouldn't be that racial pressure. And then he was shy as shy gets. I mean, it was going to be tough to get something out of him because, you know, he was very wide-eyed. And at that time, he's a kid. And, and, and that, we forget that. Yeah, you do. And, and that, was, that was a big part of my job is stripping back the athlete or um, I always say that these guys are doing the extraordinary, but to them it's ordinary. You know, to them, it's it's uh, where do I have to be? It's their day job. Sure. So being able to kind of strip that away and get the let the audience see them as I'm not just regular people, but kind of right in a sense that just you get to, you get to understand them a little bit more, um, which is you know very important. From a basketball standpoint, <clears throat> I don't know if you fall into the same boat I'm in. Vince Carter is 40 years old right now. This is just opinion right now, and he's wearing a Memphis Grizzlies jersey. It kind of, as a Raptor fan, I'm kind of pissed that he's not, you know, and I'm not saying this is his last year because we don't know that. The guy the guy still looks like he could go a couple more years for sure. And it already dates it now that he's in Sacramento. Yeah, yeah well, Sacramento. There is my yeah. mistake, yeah. exactly. So I sit there and I look at that and I go, why Why isn't he wearing a Raptor jersey to close out? Does he Does he ever talk about anything like that? Or does is there, I, like I said, I don't want to ruin anything. Or And it's not really, you know, something that would surprise me if he said, yeah, I'd love to close <laughs> out with the Raptors one day, even if it's a one-day contract. But maybe from your perspective, are you kind of disappointed that, you know, he isn't a Toronto Raptor right now, considering we're in the last call of the career? I, I am, definitely. I yeah. think... Uh, it w- it's a kind of a missed opportunity for the Raptors organization. Just first of all, whatever you offered Vince, and I don't think they could have came up to eight million at Sacramento. But whatever they, if they could have got closer to that and made him an offer, don't you think they would have made? How much would they make on merchandise? Bingo! Oh. Right away. Yeah, yeah you yeah. could have went retro yeah. jersey, real jersey, this jersey, everything. Carter, Carter, Carter. And not only that, I, I know Memphis was really trying to keep him because he was like another coach. You know, the the players really looked up to him as well. He's the respect. I just think he could add a lot, especially with a team that's looking to get over that that next little hump, right, in the playoffs. But um, everyone I'm talking to, Vince included, and everyone in his inner circle has kind of told me he's he's got another. He's got another, meaning beyond this upcoming NBA season, he wants to do one more. Yeah. So he's only signed a one-year deal with Sacramento. Maybe. Yeah, and this is just crossing our fingers. Yeah, oh, yeah. God. you know, just theorizing. That would it. be crazy. What is, be that would be just crazy. Return of the king, basically. Because, <laughs> and and really, at this point, and and again, it's so rare that you become the most loved athlete to the most hated athlete, and then back to the most loved athlete. Because that's what would happen. Because I think the place would go bananas. Because now you're talking about the generation that grew up with him as the man. Well, what happened with LeBron, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. LeBron coming yeah. back to you know that's on a, on a bigger scale. Obviously. Sure, it is. Yeah, in burned the, his jersey at one point. Still in the prime, but I think time heals, and I think this film is a nice step towards looking back and seeing the kind of player he was and the enthusiasm. That's the thing is that, you know when you start to off the top, you were talking about his his unwillingness to dunk and he was maybe wasn't trying. But in those early years, the way he did it, the enthusiasm, the energy, sure. uh, the the faces he would make after he would dunk and run up the court, all that kind of stuff, it just ignites that. Uh, you can't. How can you not cheer for him and, and root for him when you watch yeah. that stuff? So it's going to be a tiff for a couple of weeks. What for fans that can't get out to see it at tiff because right. it's going to be a tough ticket. Like I, I like I want to I want to beg you for tickets right now on the air, but I'm not. So, no, but, beg for tickets. But, Do we get to go to the to the, the <laughs> what do they call it? The opener? I'm not a, I'm not a film person. Do we get to go to the home opener? Yeah, you can tell, yeah. right? Uh, where where can fans 
uh, see this once uh, Tiff finishes up because Tiff's only so long. And then after that, I mean, what happens to the actual project so like everybody can see? Theatrical release? Mm, I don't think theatrical. It's a free agent. So they're talking to, to various outlets. Um, they'll be on Netflix. That would be good. Can we get Netflix? That's can we get you to do Netflix? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't have control over <laughs> yeah. that stuff. I know the name's been floated around, so I'm I'm not sure we'll end up, but it will definitely be in a place where okay. people will be able to. Russell, look. get Drake on the phone. What's he doing? <laughs> well, he's being lazy too. Come on, do something. You know, Sean. Uh, you know, because this is the first time we've met, and, and Dave's told this is me nice some things. That we're, but, I thought uh, this was a you know come in for five and uh, like my no. other press. Uh, no, 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 no. Get to actually yeah, we got uh, the have a conversation. Going too. Yeah, oh, I I can tell you that this this uh, you know so those they're watching live right now on on either the the website or, or YouTube, but uh, there's obviously those that will be listening on iTunes and Google Play and all those things today. This will be uh, heavily downloaded because simply the subject matter, Sean, is, uh, is, 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 I mean, and it's topical. I mean, sometimes it's like, you know, Russell asked me before he came on, he said, does he die in the end? No, he doesn't die in the end, Russell. That's not... <laughs> It's not the kind of movie. Russell made. doesn't yeah. really know yeah. these things. So, 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 you're, you, I mean, it's such, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a trigger point. It still is. If you talk to people again over the age of fifty, that I'm not saying that it's. I think more. There's still some love coming back, but there would be twenty, thirty percent who still would have this anger, this feeling, and when you've got that as a subject matter, it. you're 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 gold. You're yeah. you're golden. And I think that, you know, for the kinds of uh, subjects that you're picking, I guess for me, I'm looking at you, uh, you know, young guy, you're just killing it out there. So after this, then what can you can you now choose a project? Are we are we that big now? Yeah, well, that's that's definitely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Um, I've, I'm already lining up some some meetings down there down south in, in nice. Los Angeles. And um, good for you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point to get to. You're having, like entourage now. <laughs> yeah, he, you could be an entourage. I'm looking. I'm thinking I, you should I, be one of. He definitely fit the look. Right? Yeah. So and yeah and, and if if you want to take a look at some other stuff Menard's done, uh, I mentioned the perfect storm, the story about the expos. I talked to him about that extensively on my podcast. Phenomenal uh, fight, mom. Exceptional status. I, I mean, there's there's a lot of your your work is is amazing and it and it keeps on getting better and better which is fantastic and that's why i can't wait for the carter effect and uh you know what i, I got a feeling you know i hope you don't go too big on us but no i want it, it to be huge yeah. <laughs> like i want <laughs> iron man 8 well, sean well, menard that's well, what i want well, to I'm see. just saying <laughs> in, in 2018 or 19 or 2020 or anything like that the projects are just going to keep on getting bigger and bigger, and I, and you know, I, I couldn't be happy for you, man. It's, uh, it's, it's really exciting, that. and uh, it's awesome. So, could you work us into something? I've always wanted to be <laughs> like Purse Snatcher Three, like one of those guys, you know, like I don't like know in if Death he's Wish. Doing movies yet? Yeah, in Death Wish, shoot me in the face. I don't care. I just want to get on there, to do something. Uh, boy, I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's great to finally meet you, and it's, it's nice to see that, uh, you know, that 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 people from from. From beginnings and backgrounds, I mean, there'll be people in Hamilton that at some point they're going to be saying, well, you know, uh, Sean Menard went to this school. And I think that is always a good thing, not unlike the influence you're talking about, Vince Carter. Like, it's got to come from somewhere. And I think it's awesome when when sort of the the uh, hometown guy does well. And, 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 and now you're dealing with a hometown subject. I mean, it, it, it really does have that kind of weight for it. So uh, I, I'm, and I'm really excited to see it too. So congratulations on what's going to be, I think, a, a fantastic debut. But I think the longevity of it. I mean, this is the kind of film that I think if you're of that age group and, and you're, and again, not even necessarily a sports fan, you go, did you not see the Carter effect? It's going to be one of those. I'm, I guarantee you that's going to happen for you. I mean, that's a, that's the thing is people will say to me, uh, "Wow, you, you must be are you feeling nervous?" There's there's a lot of eyes, a lot of attention. There's sure. all these people coming to the premiere, and yeah, go hey, don't fuck it up. Yeah. <laughs> that's the boys are saying that for sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's a 75 minute red carpet. I mean, I, you know, I've never I've never even thought that it would get to that level. But um, I'm feeling good because I'm confident this film. Listen. It wouldn't, you can say, you know, you attach the names behind it and, and people will argue whether they would have came on board if it was a different type of project or someone else had done a, a you know, different job on it. But the fact is, yeah, when you're working with this subject matter, it's already there. But to take it to the next level, that's, that's, that's the, you know, the, exactly. the, the skill to the craft, right? And, and, um, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. This thing's really... I'm excited for you guys to see it because it's going to live up to the hype. Absolutely. It's going to oh. surprise you. People will come in with ex expectations and I, and I feel confident that it's it's gone above. 
Sean, thanks so much for joining us here on the program today. Really appreciate it. Uh, once again, that is the Carter Effect. It's right now currently going to debut at the Toronto International Film Festival. But trust me, with, uh, with Sean, there's going to be so much more. Best friends. Yep.